Welcome to Scott's Stream. I'm Scott Hambrick, scotthambrick.com. So, let's talk about logic. Recently wrote a blog post you can find there at scotthambrick.com, and uh, it's w the first in a series. It's called Logic, the Beginning. Uh, I've had some dust-ups that we've talked about on this show already with some people who just don't seem to understand basic logic and how we can use that to look for BS. And uh, I had some uh, responses from some of our the readers of the blog and listeners of the, this little show that uh, were interested in learning about more uh, more logic. And I needed to brush up on that stuff anyway. And one of my kids is uh, taking logic, and uh, we're getting ready to kick off a, uh, a course probably in the spring at Online Great Books on Logic. So, yeah, need to work up on this. So, uh, here we go. First of all, I want you guys to know that I'm mostly Aristotelian. Uh, there's, there's logic that is non-Aristotelian. There's Boolean. There's symbolic. There's all kinds of stuff, and I don't know a great deal about uh, some of these newer logics. Uh, but again, I'm mostly Aristotelian, and uh, I don't think uh, for the purposes of analyzing speech and ideas that come to us, uh, I don't think that most of the uh, innovations or additions uh, to the, the world of logic have advanced much past the Aristotelian. Now, for you guys that uh, split words, I'm going to say it again. For the purposes of analyzing rhetoric and thought coming at us, the new stuff doesn't add very much for us. Aristotle gets us by very nicely. You know, he's the father of reason, I think. Aristotle believed that uh, his eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and his sense of touch would get him enough sense data, and that plus his rationality would let him find the truth. And not everybody thinks that's true. Uh, the the argument I hear from people most often is like, uh, what about what about instrumentation? What about stuff you can't see? You know, and I, I think that Aristotle, I think Aristotle would go would accept data from good instrumentation like thermometers and microscopes and even electron microscopes uh, and so on. He would accept that as sense data. He would not accept her heuristic or mathematic. I think. I think. Can't ask him those questions. Uh, but based on my understanding, I don't think he would accept those things as hardcore proofs. And again, he starts with his mind and his senses. And as such, when you start, you should start at the beginning. And there is a beginning, and that's, a, that's an axiom. Um, it's a self-evident assumption that requires no additional proof. That's that's what axioms were classically. Um, I don't think that requires a proof. Something has stuff has to have a beginning. Things have to have a beginning. There has to be a start. If there isn't a start, there's always something before. There's something previous. There's something earlier. There's always something earlier. And, and like this little the funny story says, it's turtles all the way down. You have an infinite regress problem if you can't get to a beginning. And infinite regress, the infinite regress problem is a paradox. And um, we don't like paradoxes. We think those are evidence that we're going down the wrong path in thought. So uh, to solve that par paradox, um, we get to accept the beginning that we first posed. So there's a beginning. Um, and, and Aristotle tells us in his book for metaphysics um, that we have to start with the fact that stuff is. So it's important that there's a beginning because there has to be a beginning in thought. There has to be foundations. There has to be bedrock. And at the bedrock is the idea that stuff is. Things exist, and that tells us something. And in, that the, in so that they exist, or insofar as they exist, they are, and they have being. And in that they have being, we can, we can learn something from the fact that they have being. And the philosophers will say, we can learn from being qua being, or qua, or qua means insofar as, or such as it is. So we can learn something about being, such as being is, or we can learn it from being 
insofar as it is being. And everything that is has being. So the things that are true of everything are primary principles that everything else follows from. So since these, these, these facts that exist in being are at the very beginning of thought, and they are the primary principles of, that underpin everything. There are things that are true about apples that aren't true about oranges. But apples, oranges, horses, purple horseshoes, and the sun all share common traits in that they be, that they are. So that's the beginning. That's the beginning. And Aristotle tells us that those laws, these are what they, he would call these prior and that everything after these laws about being or the, these, these truths about being are posterior. So we have to start at the prior, the most prior, the primary. And this study, this study of being qua being, the common traits that everything shares, that's, that's, that's metaphysics. So he goes to great lengths in, metaphy- in the book Metaphysics. Uh, particularly book four, to show us that being, in fact, exists. Uh, I think it's Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides, I'm doing this off the top of my head, uh, is just all about being in unity and partaking in the form of being and the one. Where he, he, Plato uh, is trying to wrestle with these ideas, but I think, I think Aristotle clears it up. He shows that being exists, and he even says in book four, the metaphysics, that even non-being is non-being, because being is the thing common to everything. Um, And if your ideas about metaphysics are wrong, because the metaphysical ideas are prior, everything posterior to that, everything afterwards, is going to be wrong. Remember now, everything has being, and insofar as they be, they're the same. And uh, that makes this metaphysics stuff universal. Aristotle says, The attempts of some who discuss the terms on which truth should be accepted are due to a want of training in logic, for they should know these things already when they come to a special study and not be inquiring into them while they are pursuing it. Evidently, then, the philosopher who is studying the nature of all substance must inquire also in the principles of deduction. Later on, he writes, He whose subject is being, qua being, must be able to state most certain principles of all things. So in other words, when it's time to look at the truth of something, we already need to know the most certain principles of all things. We need to be able to build arguments from metaphysical truths. Um, And if you don't do that, well, you're probably making stuff up. So... From these metaphysical truths, Aristotle builds up uh, these three three laws of thought. Uh, Aristotle came up with these things long, long time ago, getting close to uh, getting close to twenty five hundred years ago. And uh, Bertrand Russell named them the law of identity. The second law is the law of non contradiction, and the third one is the law of the excluded middle. And uh, I'm going to write some further pieces about each of these in the upcoming weeks. So stick around for those. You can go read about uh, metaphysics here in the very beginning on scotthambrick.com. And then I will be doing uh, more blog posts and shows about the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. You can go back and look at the uh, podcasts and the posts about problematicism and see Uh, how the law of the excluded middle can be used to find some sophistry and rhetoric, which we have done with that word problematicism. I posted this uh, blog post about a week ago. I've got some questions. I have had some questions sent to me about it. I've got one here from a a guy, John, who's become an Internet friend insofar as we can have those. And he says he's got a couple of questions or at least one big question. He says, the passage Aristotle goes to great lengths to show us that being exists. He even says in Book 4, Part 2 of Metaphysics, that even non-being is non-being. He says his wife 
and uh, he and his wife had two different versions of interpreting that that passage, particularly the the non being is non being. He said, "Isn't his interpretation is that the passage is saying that even the idea of non being exists? Therefore, in some realm, non being occupies existence, even though it doesn't have content." And then he said, "His wife." Uh, felt that it should have read non-being is being and he asked what my what my understanding of that was and I think he's I think he's closer than uh, his wife is on this uh, non-being well there can be nothing that does not be right there can be nothing that isn't non-being isn't possible but we can certainly think about non-being and as such it's a concept so non-being is a concept, and the law of identity would say that non-being is non-being. Our language points with the word is, with the word is to the fact that uh, that concept exists and has truth in it, even though non-being is nonsense. The word non-being is uh, it's just like uh, dry water that's a that can't be but we can talk about dry water uh, as a concept to illustrate something else and so in fact dry water is dry water no matter how dumb or impossible it would be and then he says have I found it that I'm becoming more Socratic in my thinking or, or Aristotelian uh, by osmosis or are there steps I've taken in order to write such a blog post as this, or to think and interpret ways, uh, I'm sorry, or to think and interpret things in this particular way? Um, it ain't osmosis, or, or, hell, maybe it is. You know, at Online Great Books, we, uh, we use the Socratic method as much as we can. Um, I use the Socratic method all the time, um, to help myself identify identify words and their definitions in stuff that comes at me. I mean, this whole word, this whole the whole series of blog posts about problematicism are really about being Socratic. What is problematicism? What is it? Let's not talk about something being problematic until we figure out what problematicism means, and then after drilling down on that. On drilling down on that mean uh, or that meaning, I found out it doesn't mean anything, and that it's pure sophistry and rhetoric. Um, but as far as they're becoming more Aristotelian, um, you know, studying geometry, even as a younger person, reading Aristotle, reading Sherlock Holmes, um, and just studying logic. Uh, one of my favorite, one of the best things I've ever done was uh, studying Leonard Peikoff's uh, multi-part lecture series on, on logic. It's fantastic. So I made, a, I made a study of it over the years, and there are certainly people that know logic in a more formal and more rigid and probably more accurate way than I do. But I've come up with a rough and ready logic that I'm able to apply when I need to. I have a number of logic tools in my toolbox. And... Um, that has stood me good stead, and I hope I can help a few other a few guys come up with some uh, tools that w you can put in your toolbox that will help protect you from rhetoric and bullshit. Well, there's another podcast. I will uh, put out one on here on the Law of Identity here very soon. Stay tuned there at scotthamburg.com and look for that. Uh, send questions about this if you would like to scott at scotthamburg.com or if there's something you'd like to see me uh, hear me read me uh, about uh, send that as well